All right, so today we're starting a series on the book of Acts. If you haven't read through this book, I would encourage you, go home and start reading through it. Uh, this is the linking book between the Gospels, which is the story and life of Jesus, to the rest of the church, which goes all the way down to today. It's the linking book between the, that basically translates the ministry of Jesus into the church. And so today we're beginning this new series and it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And the challenge that we need to talk about today is this, give yourself over to the acts of God. Because the apostles in the early church, that's what they did. They gave themselves over to the acts of God. You see, it's, it's God's actions and then the interpretation of that into our daily lives. So I don't know if you've noticed this, but we live in a world of imagination. We love to use our imagination. And we love action movies. We love adventures. We love thrills. We love stories. We love risk. But of course, we, we don't really like to take risks. We like to live through risks that are safe, right? Uh, we all like roller coasters until it goes off the tracks. We all love to drive fast until we slide off the road. And we all love being courageous behind the keyboard and, you know, when we're online and social media and stuff, we say stuff that, you know, makes us feel strong and big. We like to be, we like to be risk takers, but then when someone finds our address out, that's a problem. And we want to be leaders and we want people to listen to us when we speak, but but the reality is when people's real lives are on the line and it's our words that need to lead them through that, then we don't want that, right? Because it's risk and, and those acts have risk attached to them. And we prefer simulation over risk. We prefer to experience the thrill of these things without the real risk involved, right? We like to be able to sit in the comfort of our living room and fly an airplane as opposed to being 30,000 feet up and flying the airplane when we haven't been trained to do that. We like to be simulating the things. And so often that's the translation of church in our lives. That's what happens so often in our lives when it comes to church. You come to church and man, there's this wonderful experience. It gets our imagination going. You know, we read stories from the Bible and it gets our imagination going and, and all of those, those feelings that we can have. And sometimes we can have a great experience in church, you know, smoke and lights and all kinds of drama going on right here in church that gets our imaginations going. And then we walk out into the real world, right? The market to take you to a world of imagination is huge. And with today's graphics, we can just sit in the comfort of our living room and do that. You can dream up something, and if you can put it into words, you can tell AI now to what you want, and it will produce something for you that you can see that came from within your imagination. A few months ago, someone told AI to create a beautiful and colorful image of the Charlie's Chocolate Factory. Y'all remember Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Remember that? Yeah. And they were like, all right, create this beautiful image. And AI, put this image out and look at this. It, they, were, they were promoting Willie's Chocolate Experience. How many would want to go th th to see that? Wouldn't that be awesome? They charged like 35 euros, which is about 38 bucks for us. And, and to get into this place in the last weekend of February, just, just last month, Feb or a couple of months ago, hundreds of people bought tickets for this. They brought their kids to it to see the surprise at every turn that they promised. Here's what they got. Not quite, right? <laughs> People were furious. Pretty awesome. And, and, but that's what it feels like sometimes. We come to church and we, we hear these stories about people who experienced great things in, in, in Christ. And we read through the Bible and there's all these wonderful healings. And there's all these, the dead are raised and the sick are healed. The blind can see it. All of these things that happened in scripture and things. And, and, and it sounds like it's some big Promotion.
But it's not. It's not pretend. It's real. It's what really happened. It's not fiction. It's not just someone telling us another Harry Potter type of story that has magic and all of the stuff in it. It's real. It really happened. And I promise you it is still happening and God still wants to do the things that he did. And Jesus even talked about it, that you and I would do even greater things than he did. And you and I, as members of the body of Christ, his church, we are living the continuation of the book of Acts today. And just because the writer stopped writing doesn't mean that God and his people stopped. Where's the amen on that one? So there's a, a writer in the Bible, his name is Luke. He was Dr. Luke. He was a medical doctor. And Luke, you can imagine, he wasn't one of Jesus' disciples. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. And Luke, being a doctor, people started coming to Luke and were telling him about this man that was raised from the dead. Well, obviously, as a doctor, he's like, well, people don't get raised from the dead. Well, what happened to him? Well, he was bludgeoned, he was beaten, he was ripped to shreds, and he was hanged on a cross. What do you mean he came back to life? How could he possibly come back to life? That's impossible. Something is to this. And so Luke became a Christian. He became a believer as a medical doctor. And so after this, he became so intrigued by what Jesus, you know, the people that had firsthand saw Jesus. And so he went around interviewing all these people about Jesus Probably the Mary, the mother of Jesus. He was a contemporary of that time. These people were still alive. He went and interviewed all of the disciples. You can imagine the stories that these people told. Peter and Matthew. All of the... And Mark, Mark, he was, Mark was a teenager when Jesus was around. You know, and he probably found him and asked him about certain things. And all of the stuff that, that these guys told and the stories that they told. He was like, these are first hand experience stories that these people have told. And so he writes to this guy, this guy's name is Theophilus. And so the book of Acts begins with this. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, what book is he talking about? He's talking about the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. All right. Because the gospel of Luke was also written to Theophilus. He was writing to this one guy and these two letters ended up in the Bible. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? So he says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So Dr. Luke writes this second letter to Theophilus, the book of Acts. And, and, and Luke tells us why he's writing to Theophilus back in the gospel of Luke. And he's writing this because Theophilus has been taught about Jesus, who Jesus is, and what Jesus did, and how he was raised from the dead, and all of this. And he's writing this, he says, for Theophilus to know and have confidence that he was, what he was taught is true. So who is Theophilus? Well, we have an idea of who he was because Josephus, who was a contemporary historian at that time, he wrote that there was a man named Theophilus that was actually the high priest from 37 to 42 or 41 AD, AD 37 to 41 AD. Now, you understand what time was, when, what year was Jesus crucified? Anybody know? 33. So these guys are right in line. I mean, they were alive when Jesus was, was crucified. And so from 37 to 41 AD, Theophilus was known to be the high priest. And most likely that's the guy that Luke is writing to. So you can imagine this, picture this. Luke is probably Theophilus's doctor. Just imagine with me here. Theophilus comes in and he's like, oh, all right, breathe in. And don't you hate when they tell you to breathe out and they, they move it to another spot and you're like, I can't, I can't breathe in yet. And he's probably one of those doctors, you know, just too quick on the draw. And he's, hey, have you heard about Jesus? Yeah, the one that you guys crucified? His heart really starts going, right? 
And Theophilus starts listening to him. You can imagine this. And Theophilus was probably somebody that Luke was trying to reach. Definitely somebody Luke was trying to reach. Somebody that he was trying to convince. He says, you've heard about this guy. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 1. This is how he introduced the gospel of Luke, all right? This is a different book than Acts. He said, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. What an interesting way to start a book, right? Or a letter. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. He's talking about the works of Jesus. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He's talking about the disciples. With this in mind, since I have caref- I myself, I myself, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Theophilus, Theophilus, I don't know if you know this or not, but Theophilus actually means God lover. So this guy, he's, his name means he's a lover of God. So obviously he's somebody that was searching. And as the high priest, if, if that's who this guy was, how interesting is that? That there is this other guy that, that this doctor is writing him letters saying, all right, here's what I've investigated and found out here in the church. This thing is real and there is certainty. There are eyewitnesses. This really happened. This guy raised from the dead. This is amazing. So both letters, Luke is writing to give him the certainty of what Jesus, what he had already heard about Jesus. And he's saying, this is absolutely true. So when you read the book of Luke and the book of Acts, you read with the understanding that Luke was writing for the purpose of presenting evidence, first century evidence. Proofs and evidence, convincing evidence, things that were written that this intellectual said, this is, this is absolutely true. This happened. This is awesome. So look at the first actions. Let's go to Acts now, the beginning of Acts. And let's look at the first actions that were recorded in this book. Because, you know, that's what the book of Acts is about. It's about the actions, the acts of the early church. And it starts with the acts of Christ. Pretty awesome, right? So he says, Theophilus, in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up into heaven. So if you read through the book of Luke, you get to the very end, you see that he records at the end of the book of Luke, Jesus ascending. He flew out of here. And he says, after giving instructions to, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, he was taken up into heaven. That's pretty awesome. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion... While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized, he's talking about John the Baptist, baptized in water. But in few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I think Jill got it. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. What did the people want when Jesus was coming in on Palm Sunday? A king to raise up Jerusalem, to raise up Israel and make them the most powerful nation in the world. And this is what these people have been taught all of their lives that the Messiah would come and do. And so... All of this time, and Jesus, as he's coming in on Palm Sunday, he's like, okay, I'm not going to have any of this. This is not the reason why I'm coming. So Jesus gets a donkey, and he drags his feet as he's coming into Jerusalem, and everybody's like, Hosanna in the highest. This does not look cool. He could have gotten a, a horse, maybe, or even a camel would have done well. But he comes riding in on a donkey? How embarrassing is this? And Jesus was just like, this is not why I'm here. I'm not here to be raised up as the king of Israel. I am the king of kings and Lord of lords. 
And so here we come to this same scenario, and Jesus was continually dealing with it. And he says, all right, guys, come on. This is what's going to happen. I need you to stay here in Jerusalem. I need you to wait for the gift my father's promised. You've heard me talk about it. And, and this is, in a few days, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost was coming. This was a prophetic thing that had happened all throughout the Old Testament. It was the Feast of Wheats. And, and it was the Feast of Harvest, I mean, and that's where the harvest would come in. So this is the, the symbolism of what the Holy Spirit coming into their lives was, that they would be able to bring in the harvest, right? And so he gets through all of that, and he says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have this amazing experience with, with, with the Father, with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Hmm. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. And you can imagine they were like, okay, we were saying, singing Hosanna and waving palm branches as you came into Jerusalem. That was exciting. We thought you'd make a great king then, but now you've conquered death. You raised from the dead. Now it's time to really put you in the king's spot. How many of you know that would make a pretty powerful king? Our king conquered death. And Jesus didn't even answer them with what they were thinking. He's like, okay. He said to them, It's not for you to know the dates or times the Father has set by his own authority. But you, you will receive power. not about me being king here. It's about you receiving power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. Wow. And they were probably like, okay, yeah, but we really want you to be our king. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Listen, this, this wasn't fake Superman stuff. He literally flew out of here. And then a cloud enveloped him. They were looking intently into the sky. I think we can imagine that after this past Monday. <laughs> Remember looking around, everybody. And that's what they were doing. When suddenly two men dressed in white, I think it's pretty cool that they were dressed in white. They dressed in white. They stood beside them. And men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. Wow. That's pretty cool. This same Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus that died on the cross. The same Jesus that raised the dead and raised from the dead. The same Jesus that flew out of here that day is coming back for us. Wow. So he begins this book of Acts with this concept that this same Jesus is coming back. So what he's saying is, is exactly what Jesus said a lot. And so what he's bringing to the table here at the beginning of this book for us is an understanding that there's accountability and responsibility for, for us. There's accountability and responsibility. And Jesus talked about this a lot through his, through his teachings in his parables. And I want to read to you today 
all the way through Matthew chapter 25. And I want to give you three different things that he's going to be looking for from Matthew chapter 25. Because Jesus is talking about it here. And it's so important for us to get this into our spirit. That God has expectations and there's accountability and responsibility for you and me. Now listen, I know this isn't exciting to, to hear. I know that you don't want to come to church and hear that there's more accountability and more responsibility for your life. But what I'm telling you is this. There is nothing more important in your life to get done than doing the things that Jesus talked about doing. And one day you're going you're gonna to get there and you're going to be like, oh, I, I don't want to get to heaven and walk in and go, oh, man, look at this place. This is way more than Willy Wonka's thing. This is reality. And you walk into heaven and go, oh, why didn't I make my whole life about this? So Jesus talked about it. So in uh, Matthew chapter 25, I want to read to you parable number one. He speaks of respectful relationship. You will be held accountable for how much you respect your relationship with him and respect him as God in your life. So Jesus said it this way. God's kingdom is like 10 young virgins who took oil lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Five were silly and five were smart. Get that in mind. What do silly young ladies look like compared to smart young ladies? All right, get that in mind. The silly virgins took lamps, but no extra oil. The smart virgins took jars of oil to feed their lamps. In other words, they brought extra just in case they needed it, in case the bridegroom was late in coming or later than they thought he was coming, right? So the bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him, and they all fell asleep. How many of you know God doesn't always show up when you want him? He always shows up, just not when you want him. All right. So the bridegroom didn't show up as they thought. And there are times, I don't know about you, but there are times I'm like, oh, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. I am done here. You know, anybody ever been there? The bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him and they all fell asleep. In the middle of the night, someone yelled out, he's here. The bridegroom is here. Go out and greet him. The ten virgins got up and they got their lamps ready. The silly virgins said to the smart ones, our lamps are going out. Lend us some of your oil. I mean, if you're nice and kind, you'll lend us some of your oil. And responsibly, they said, no, there might not be enough for us to go to go around. Go buy your own. So they did, but while they were out buying oil, the bridegroom arrived. When everyone was there to greet him and had gone into the wedding feast, the door was locked. The door was locked. Much later, the other virgins, the silly ones, showed up and knocked on the door saying, Master, we're here. Let us in. He answered, Do I know you? I don't think I know you. What's he talking about? He's talking about relationship. He's talking about respect, paying attention, being alert, looking and being ready for him to come. This is what Jesus is saying. I'm coming back. I'm the master and you need to be ready for me to come back. That's important, right? Imagine, I mean, it's kind of like to put it into our words, you know, say you had a nine-year-old child and, and you had saved up for years and finally you were like, all right, I'm going to get to take you to Disney World. And you say, all right, in order for us to go to Disney World tomorrow, I need you to make sure that you get a good night's rest. You have your stuff packed and ready to go and be excited tomorrow. Be ready and up and ready when it's time because we got to hit a flight and all of these things. And, and, and you, you let the kid go to bed and, and they don't do anything. Instead, they stay up playing video games all night and they didn't get packed. They didn't take care of anything. The next morning you go in and you wake them up and they're like, oh, Oh, I don't want to, oh, I don't want to get up. And you're like, I have, I have saved up for years to take you on this trip to Disney World. I'm so excited to do this for you. And this is the best you get. How many of you know, if that's me, I'm not taking them to Disney World today, right? Not going to happen. And in, in the same way, Jesus is like, this is, this is huge. This is the biggest thing that has ever happened and will ever happen. I'm coming back for you. Be excited. Be ready. Get your lamp oil ready. What is he talking about? He's talking about on a daily basis, you have God's anointing in your life. You have his purpose in your life, his presence in your life. You're doing things. You're doing actions that say, I'm a believer in Christ. 
Pretty awesome, huh? This isn't imagination. He's not offering something. He hasn't put something down here, this little promotional, hey, come to heaven. It's going to be wonderful. A world of imagination. Surprising events around every corner. This is real. It's real. It's real. So Jesus went on. And he spoke of a risk-taking relationship. He wants risk-takers. So he says, it's also like a man going off on an extended trip. The man being God. So, you know, Jesus has been on an extended trip, right? He called his servants together and delegated responsibilities to one, he gave $5,000. To another, 2000 Another, 1000 depending on their abilities. He left, and right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. Second one did the same. But the man with a single thousand dug a hole, carefully buried his master's money. All right, so, in case you're a little ADD, let me give it to you. <laughs> to one guy, he gave 5000 Another, he gave 2000 Another, he gave one according to their abilities. The guy with 5,000, after a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled it with him. The one with 5,000 had doubled his money. The one with 2,000 had doubled his money. The first one buried it, all right? The master of those three servants came back, settled up with him. The one given 5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. And his master said, good work. You did your job well. From now on, you're my partner. The one with 2,000, same exact thing. Great job. Awesome. That's what I expected. The servant with the 2,000, uh, the servant with the 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards. And I know that, that you hate careless ways, that you demand the best and make no allowances for error. How many of you know someone that has a perception of God like this? God demands perfection. God has high standards. God has, hates careless ways. And I was afraid that I would disappoint you. And so, therefore, I found a good hiding place, a secure place for your money. So here's your money, safe and sound, every penny of it. And look at what the master says. He was furious. He said, that's a terrible way to live. He was offended. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew that I was after the best, why do you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers where it would have at least gotten a little interest. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him out into utter darkness. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, you don't even have a clue who I am. I would have been way happier if you had taken a risk with my money and lost it than what you did with it. And you come back to me saying it's my fault because your perception of me is that I'm a hard slave master. I'm a taskmaster that has a a bad attitude and I'm going to just throw you into hell. He says, that's your perception of me. Okay, well, that's what you get. Interesting, huh? What is your perception of him? Do you see him as somebody that wants you to be a risk taker? Because he does. See, Jesus is challenging you to get to know God, really. To get to know who he is, what he likes, and what he doesn't like. And this is one of those things that you've got to understand that he likes. God is looking for people who will take a risk. 
People who will give above and beyond. People who will go the extra mile. People who will take risks in their lives for Him. God is looking for people who won't just read about an adventure, but people who will actually get up and be a part of an adventure. God is looking for people who will take what He gave them and invest it. Doing something with your talent, doing something for Him with your time, doing something with your money for Him. Every breath in your body that you would do something for Him. He's not looking for play it safe people. He's looking for people who will take risks. People who will step out of the boat and say, all right, sink or swim, I'm diving in, Jesus. He's looking for people who, even though they aren't perfect, even though they don't know they, or don't, even though they know they don't deserve him, that they will still take a risk and say, God, I'll still give it, I'll give it a shot. I trust in your grace. I trust in your mercy. I trust you're a good God. And I'm going to keep trying. So, he spoke a risk-taking relationship. And he speaks of random kindness relationship. Random kindness relationship. James David, would you come? So Jesus continues in this chapter. And he's talking about when he's coming back. Remember? This is what I'm looking for, he says. When I come back. When I come back. This same Jesus. He's coming back. And look at the description Jesus gives here of that moment. When he finally arrives, when I finally arrive, blazing in beauty and all his angels with him. And all of the world wanted to come and see, look, the moon moved in front of the sun. And it was pretty amazing. I didn't think it would be. But it was pretty cool. But imagine what it's going to be like when what Jesus just described and what it's described as in other places in Scripture to be that moment when the trumpet sounds. Suddenly, the ground shakes, the graves open, and the dead in Christ rise. Something happens. We will be caught up in the air with him. And suddenly, there's Jesus. He's not on a donkey. He's on the most beautiful white stallion this world has ever seen. Blazing in glory. That's what he said. And it's kind of interesting. Here's Jesus, the one that comes riding in on a colt and all of, or riding in on a donkey, and he's just dragging. Jesus, that same Jesus, knows what a glorious moment it's going to be. He says, I'm going to be blazing in glory in that moment. All of my glory, all of my splendor is going to be there. I'm not going to be holding back, looking all humble and calm. I'm going to look like something to be dealt with. I'm going to be fierce, and I'm going to be taking my people with me. They're going to be caught up in the air with me to be with me forever. This same Jesus is coming back, but this time it's going to be absolutely amazing. And all the angels of heaven, you know, and the scripture says that there were 72,000 angels in the air when Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. And don't you know, those angels were available probably when he was hanging on the cross. Just hours later, 72,000 angels in the air. And how many are going to be there in that moment? Just beautiful. 
The Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. I'm going to go sit down on my throne. But then he gets serious and he says, listen, you need to know this is what's going to happen. All the nations will be arranged before him and he will sort the people out much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, enter, you who are blessed by my father, take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It will be ready for you since the world's foundation and here's why. Jesus begins to list acts of random kindness. I was hungry. You fed me. I was thirsty. And you gave me a drink. I was homeless. And you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit me. I was in prison and you came to me. I didn't have a way to church on Sunday morning because the lift in my van had broken and you fixed it. And this week, Harvey's van is going to get fixed so Connie can be here next Sunday. Because you did that. I was a kid in the nursery and you changed my diaper. I was a kid in kids' church and you came out and you taught me. Even if there was only one there, it was me and you did that for me came to church on Sunday and I was scared walking in the house and you welcomed me. One day I was sitting in church and you got up and told your story of how God healed you or saved you or delivered you from an addiction and I changed my life. And you say, Master, what are you talking about? When do we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when do we ever see you sick or in prison and, and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling you the solemn truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm promising you right now, this is true, this is true, this is true. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, you, would, you did it for me. That was me you did it for. He says, then he will turn to the goats, the ones on his left, and say, get out, worthless goats. You're good for nothing but, but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was homeless, you gave me no bed. I was shivering and you gave me no clothes. I was sick and in prison and you never visited. Then those goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison and didn't help? He will answer them, I'm telling you the solemn truth. I'm telling you the truth. Pay attention. Listen to me. I'm telling you the truth. Whenever you failed to do one of these things for someone who was being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it for me. Then those goats will be herded to their eternal doom, but the sheep to their eternal reward. God is looking for people who will do random acts of kindness. People who will respect him. People who will take risks for him. God is searching the world looking for people who will have that kind of a respect and relationship for him. And recognize that we live and die for him. Listen, this is, it's, it's, it's not like... You know, just your imagination. This is not about you just using your imagination. It's about reality. It's about you really stepping in and saying, all right, I'm in the book. And I'm not talking about like Blue's Clues where you skidoo into the Bible, you know. I'm talking about really living it out. 
I remember when I was growing up, uh, my, my pastor, he taught a series called Acts chapter 29. What was he saying? There's only 28 chapters in that book. And we're living out 29. And it's probably more like 200 and something by now. But we're living it out. He's, he's saying, you know what? We're just as much a part of this. And even though they've stopped writing that at this point, it's still there. It's still true. We get to be a part of it. This isn't, this isn't play. This is reality. This is real. Are you in? I'm not talking about being bitten by a spider and you becoming Spider-Man. Or being wrapped up by a bunch of green leaves and trees and stuff and becoming poison ivy or something. I'm talking about reality. This is reality. And all of that imagination and all of its fun because it's safe. Oh, I can imagine Superman. Or I can imagine all of these superheroes doing these things, but this is real. And today, there are people who are smuggling the Bible into countries that don't want it. You should hear the stories. Stories of, of vans full of Bibles tucked away or even sometimes just all out and, and they're blind to it because of God protecting the people taking them in. They're just praying, God, please don't let them see them. Please don't let them, please don't let them pull us over. And they, they, they get through. It's absolutely astounding. There are stories of missionaries who were protected by giant men that they never saw, but their adversaries did. True stories, stories of God lovers looking death in the face, knowing that God was with them through it all. It's just like what you read through the book of Acts. And as we get into this, you're going to see things happening. And, and we're going to begin to see things happening in our own lives. How many of you know we're living in the last days? It's time for the church to rise up and be seen and know. And let's begin to do the acts of God in our lives. This is why Jesus told the disciples, wait here. You're going to need what the Father is going to give you. Because you're going to be able to do things greater and bigger than I ever did. They would need the power of the Holy Spirit. So today, at the start of this, it seems appropriate to take this step. Give yourself over to the acts of God. And if you give yourself over to the acts of God, how many of you know he's going to empower you to do that? So what I want to challenge you to do is this week, begin looking, reading through the book of Acts. Come on, get ahead of me. And you start seeing and praying and asking God to help you to believe greater things than you've ever believed before. That he will use you in ways that you never thought he would use you. You decide, God, I'm going to be ready. I respect you. I respect you. Come on, would you pray with me? God, I respect you. I will not let my oil run dry while I wait for you. I'm going to store it up and prepare. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe, I'm going to get to know who you are, what you like and don't like. And God, I'm going to prepare myself for your return. I'm going to be ready and waiting, and I can't wait. You decide to take risks. God, I decide I'm going to take risks for you. I'm going to give more than I, than I should, I think, because I believe in you. God, I'm going to do more. I'm going to go the extra mile. What others say I shouldn't or couldn't do, I'm going to trust you for it. God, I want to do things that please you. Help me in Jesus' name.
and you decide to do random acts of kindness. God, help me to see the people around me. That I can take care of the people that I can help, especially those that I can help without them even knowing it. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you don't know him yet. But today, today is the day. And right where you are, seated where you are, I want you to just talk to him. Say, Jesus, I want to get to know who you are. I want, to, I, I want to know what you like and don't like. And I want to accommodate for you living inside of me for the rest of my life. I want a relationship with you. And I thank you for forgiving me for my sin. Thank you for what you did for me on the cross. I turn my life over to you today. Thank you. Wash me. Cleanse me. Give me a new beginning, a new life. God, I want to have that relationship with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if that was you, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to give you just an opportunity to say, yeah, John, that was me today. I gave my heart to Christ, fresh and new. I want you to just look up at me until my eyes catch yours, if that was you today. Right.